Hello, in this video, we are going to be going through topic two of the data booklet. That's right, some data booklet review. We're going to sort of annotate this data booklet together. Topic two, mechanics, the most important core topic to know by far. Um, so I'm going to guide you through what you should do for every single section of the data booklet before you take the IB exams. You have to know your data booklet. You absolutely positively must know every single equation in the data booklet, what it is, what it means, what every variable stands for, when to use it, when not to use it. You know, fun, key, weird rules about the data booklet, all that kind of stuff. Um, so you really do want to go through and d know all of the equations in the data booklet to this level of detail, the level of detail we're going to get into right now. Um, but we'll do this one as an example together, so let's go. First up is topic 2.1, motion, and the classics, everybody's favorite, the SUVAT equations. There they are. Um, handy reference for you, all your equations of motion. All right, um, make sure you know what these variables are and um, for all the variables, you want to be this specific. S is not just displacement. It's displacement at time t. All right, all of these things are fun. You got to know what's a function of time and what's not. Like u is not a function of time. U is your initial velocity. In other words, your velocity at time t equals zero. T is the time. Maybe we should really say time elapsed because it's the time since your starting condition. All right, it's really the time since u happened. Uh, v is a function of t. A is a function of t. In other words, these are your three instantaneous variables. Right, so I can measure the displacement, velocity, and or acceleration at any moment in time after a certain starting condition, u. All right, um, you'll notice I'm doing this. The, the data booklet doesn't give you any vector bars on the equations, which is uh, kind of heinous, but they do that for a reason because they want you to know what's a vector and what's not. So you have to know these are all vectors. Time is not a vector, right? So make sure you know in your data booklet what are the units of every variable, What's well, like the definition of every variable, more than just the name of the word, but like in the context of the equation, what does it mean? Know what's a vector, know what's a scalar. All right, so those are the equations. Um, so there's some rules you wanna know about those things and some like key ideas you wanna know. So you wanna know like what is displacement, what is velocity, what is acceleration really? Remember those are your vectors, there's also scalars. All right, remember vectors, magnitude and direction, scalars, magnitude only, so size of the number only. Um, think of displacement as your kind of sort of position. It's better to say distance from zero, right? It's your position in terms of your starting point zero. Um, velocity, these are the two really important definitions to make sure you know. What is velocity really? It's the gradient of displacement. It's your delta uh, x over delta time. It's your change in position over change in time. It's how quickly you're changing where you are over time. It is not meters per second. That is absolutely not a definition of velocity, right? Um, that's not going to get you there if there's any acceleration happening. Similarly, acceleration is not V over T. It's delta V over delta T. There's a big difference. Make sure you're cool with the difference. Um, but it's the gradient of velocity, so the rate of change of velocity over time. We would do this, well, well, we'll do it in a second, tangent line stuff, right? All right. Um, they're going to ask you about averages sometimes, and so for an average, only for an average, can you do a total over total. So you can do total like meters over total seconds to get average velocity, basically, or average speed if you're dealing with distances. But that'll only give you the average. So um, units do not make an equation. That's something we'll keep coming back to. That's a common mistake. But in this case, just doing meters divided by seconds, the total distance over total time can give you average values. On instantaneous values, you got to use your SUVAT equations. To use the SUVAT equations, remember the limitations. So this is part of knowing the data booklet. You got to know if you see a question and ask you about acceleration, you might be tempted to jump right to the classic SUVATs, but this only works when these conditions are met, right? So if you have like a ball hits a wall and then rebound ba rebounds backwards, you can't use SUVAT for it. Think about why. Um, Here's one of the key reasons. You have to have a constant acceleration acting throughout the duration of your equation doing the math uh, for these to work. So the key example where we see this a lot is remember stuff like uh, you throw something, you throw a stone up in the air, classic problem, right? Um, the common mistake is to say, okay, this thing starts at zero velocity, then its starting speed would be zero because it starts in your hand. That's wrong because we're going to put in our equation for sure, we're going to say the acceleration of y is like a g, right? Well, that's only happening when the stone is in free fall and the force of gravity is the only thing acting on it. 
And that's not happening during the touch of the hand here, right? So the problem, the Suvet equation can start working the instant it leaves this gentleman's hand. So my initial speed is going to be whatever speed he throws it with, because then it starts with this speed while it's moving only under the influence of gravity. And then, you know, whatever, it slows down, turns around, speeds up, blah, blah, blah. And if it goes down and hits the water down here or something, we're not going to say the final speed is zero either, because once it hits the water, there's other forces happening. So there's another acceleration, right? So we would find the speed that it hits the water with, you know, the final speed that it's going at as it plunges into the water, but we can't say it's zero. All right, so constant acceleration, you got to think about what that means. Also, you can only work in one dimension at a time. So they're either horizontal or vertical, typically. Um, a SUVAT table is a good idea, right? Especially if you have like a two-dimensional problem with a projectile. You want to break it into X and Y components. Think about the X displacement versus the Y displacement, the initial speed in X, the initial speed in Y, acceleration in X, acceleration in Y, so on, so on. Um, watch your plus, plus and minus signs. That's true for everything, especially SUVAT. It can be an uh, easy source of little mistakes. So pay attention to direction because most of these things are vectors. Um, remember that usually in a normal, say, projectile problem, the horizontal acceleration is zero, um, unless you have a rocket or something, right? And the vertical acceleration is negative G. Uh, probably 10 on a paper one, maybe 9.81, use a data booklet on a paper two. All right, and make sure you're okay with what those equations mean graphically because you will use motion graphs. So remember how this works. Calculus fans now, you all know these are just derivatives and integrals, right? Velocity is the derivative of position, really, kind of displacement. So velocity is the derivative of this graph. Acceleration is the derivative of this graph. So, of course, if I want to find my uh, velocity at a moment in time on a displacement versus time graph, I know oops, that the gradient of the displacement versus time graph gives me velocity. So I could go to like two seconds on this graph, draw a tangent line, take the slope of that tangent line. Guess what? I bet you would get a slope of four right around here. If I went to three seconds, guess what? I guess you would, I bet you would get a slope of right around uh, six. Yeah. So the gradient moves you this way on the graph. And um, because calculus, right, integrals, the area under the curve would move you backwards. So I could take the area of an acceleration versus time graph, let's say for the first second, right, the area would be my change in velocity officially. And so from zero to two sec zero to one second, my velocity would change by the area of this box. Two meters per second squared tall by one second wide gives me two meters per second. And that would tell me my velocity at this time. Yeah, so the Area under the curve lets you move, quote, backwards on these graphs. Gradient lets you move these ways. Of course, make sure you can do all that stuff on mechanics graphs. And do generally know because, um, you know, again, the definition of velocity is this. Know that this is the format for, sorry, the definition of acceleration is this. This is the format for a gradient. And if it helps, you don't need this for IB physics, but we're really talking derivatives, right? So if you see the delta over delta, it's really a derivative in disguise. The rate of change, and so you're talking about slopes of tangent lines. Okay, 2.2 forces, so part two of mechanics. All right, F equals MA. If you think this equation means force equals mass times acceleration, you are super not ready for the IB exams. That's not good enough, not at all. All right, what it really means is this. You gotta know that F is a net force, and it's all one directional. So really, it means all of this all together. You gotta know what's a vector and what's not, that it happens in one dimension. All right, so really F equals MA, F is the sum of all forces or the net force acting on a single object in one dimension. That's what F means in F equals MA. It's not just force. Uh, I'll show you why that matters. M is the mass of the object being accelerated. You know, sometimes in problems, you're going to have like multiple different masses. Which one do I use? Well, if we're talking about this, it's the M that's your the object in your free body diagram, right? It's the mass that's being acted on by all these forces. And A is the acceleration of that object in the dimension that we're summing the forces in. So if I'm summing the forces in X, I can find the horizontal acceleration. If I'm summing the forces in Y, I can find the vertical acceleration. You need an FBD to use this equation. If you try to use this equation without an FBD, you're doing it wrong. All right, take the time, sketch it out, even if it's a real quick and sloppy one. Make an FBD because you need to sum the forces to use this equation. Um, and remember, to if you have... Uh, uh, forces acting at different angles, you need to use components. 
So if you have a force like this away, you got to break it up into an X piece and a Y piece and then account for them, you know, one dimension at a time. All right, let's look at this. Try this problem. Try this problem with F equals MA. Pause the video, see what you come up with. Okay, um, there's a trick answer they want you to do because they want you to go, oh, F equals MA. So let's see, the acceleration would be F over M and they gave me an F of 60 and they gave me an M of eight. That's wrong, that's super wrong because F doesn't mean force, F means net force. Yeah, so what you wanna do is sketch your little FBD. I got an eight kilogram thing falling to drag force. So this thing is falling, so it's moving down. So the drag force I know is gonna be opposite to the direction of motion. It's a resistive force. So the drag force is gonna be like this and that's like 60 Newtons. But what I gotta think about is that's not the only force. This is a thing, so it's got a weight. The weight, whoops, the weight is gonna be uh, always little m times g. So eight kilograms times 10-ish meters per second squared. So it weighs 80 Newtons, All right? That's one you gotta know. That's one force calculation you gotta super know how to do. The weight of an object near the surface of Earth at least is uh, m times g. So it's 80 Newtons down, 60 Newtons up. That means the net force is 80 minus 60 is 20 Newtons down. And because the net force is 20, I'm going to do uh, 20 divided by 8, right? Which, uh, oh boy, let's see. I don't know. 4 goes into the both of these, right? So what? 5 over 2, so 2.5. All right. Um, so... That's the difference between F and net F. Make sure you're cool with it. FBD every time you're trying to F equals MA. All right. Um, know your inclined plane. This is a classic problem. Know how to do forces on a ramp, on an inclined plane. Um, so remember, if you have this situation, you always have the weight vector acting straight down. It pulls down towards the center of the earth. Doesn't matter about the ramp. This is the normal force. Remember, normal means perpendicular. That's the math word for perpendicular. So we're perpendicular to the surface. The normal force always is. Um, the normal force does not equal the weight of the object, then, in this case. All right, so make sure you're okay with this. you got to be able to make this special right triangle um, whenever you're dealing with a ramp. So kind of practice is memorize this. This is how you do it. You, the easiest thing to do is use an angled uh, coordinate system. So have, like, a parallel to the ramp uh, dimension, which we could still call x, just like tilted x, and a perpendicular to the ramp dimension, which uh, we call y or perpendicular. All right, so we the weight is the one we can break up into components then, because like even if there's friction, then friction is going to be along x, our new x, right? Um, if there's like a rope pulling down the ramp, that would be in negative x. If there's a rope pulling up the ramp, that'd be in positive x. So this makes things easy. The only thing you got to deal with then is break the weight vector up into x and y pieces. Um, remember that this angle is the same as the angle of the ramp and so you do some trig and it all works out like this so make sure you can do all of this all right this is the breakdown of the weight vectors on an inclined plane so you want to be able to do mg sine of theta is the amount of weight pulling the thing down the ramp mg cosine of theta is the amount of weight pushing the box down into the ramp all right all right so know those know your inclined plane all right, and friction, there's equations for the forces of friction in your data booklet. You got to know the difference between the two types of friction. These little coefficients help you a lot. One's dynamic, one's static. All right, uh, so what these variables mean, FF is force of friction. Uh, it could be either dynamic or static. In this first example, it's a dynamic friction, right? This one's static. Uh, I got my coefficients of dynamic and static friction, and R is normal force. Okay, um... Make sure you're okay with why this is an inequality and why this is an equal sign. The idea is static friction is a reactive force, so it can react to what's happening um, up to some maximum. So we have a maximum amount of static friction. That would be when this is an equal sign. The biggest the force of friction could be is this big, but it could be less than that, so it could also be zero or in between. right? So this is the amount of force it takes to get something moving uh, when it's sitting down on the ground or whatever, and there's friction that would keep it from moving for a little bit. So if I don't push at all, there's no force of friction. If I push just a little bit, if I push like with one Newton of force, and that puts me here, then there's one Newton of static friction resisting me to keep the net force zero. I push with eight Newtons of force, I can push back with eight, 
But if like 10 is the cutoff, right, as soon as I push above that maximum, then it starts moving. Once it starts moving, static friction stops and kinetic friction is happening or dynamic friction. And that is just always a certain amount. All right, so that one doesn't change or react with you. If it's moving, there's this much friction acting. If it's not moving or if you're trying to figure out if it's moving, that's your like upper boundary for static friction. So think about this graph. Know the difference between dynamic and static. When a problem, make sure you're thinking about what's happening. All right, and normal force. You got to find normal force from these. Normal force does not equal mg. That's not a thing. You got to draw an FBD and figure it out every time. All right, there is no formula for the normal force. You must make an FBD. You must do net force to find the normal force, just like over here, right? In this case, the normal force, um, I'm thinking, would be equal to the Y component of your weight. Because if there's no other vertical forces happening and this thing is a moving vertical, then there's no, uh, I should do this, then there's no acceleration in y so this minus this would sum to zero so these two forces would be balanced that changes again though if i have like a force pulling up the ramp or something like that now now things are different all right so you always got to look at an fbd see what's going on the normal force is a reactive force it reacts to all of the other forces uh into and out of the surface so you got to always account for it with an fbd don't just put mg for the normal force it will steer you wrong sometimes it happens but not always okay Part three, work, power, and energy. Okay, uh, this equation, work equals Fs cosine theta. Pretty good equation for work. Uh, this will tell me how much work a force does. So W is the work done by force. F is the size of the force doing work. S is the displacement of the object in meters. And theta is the angle between those two vectors. That you definitely got to memorize. It's the angle between F and S if you connect them to each other. All right. Um, so that'll tell you the size of work. Um, yeah, this is a picture if you want. It's kind of like saying um, you take the component of the force perpendicular to displacement because that's the piece of the, the force that can really do work. Remember what this equation means if there's a force perpendicular to motion, if this thing is sliding to the right, but I pull up a little bit, this piece of the force, Fy here, is not doing any work. You're only doing work when you're forcing in the direction of your displacement. All right. Um, the most important equation for work is this, which is not in the data booklet. That just comes from you understanding work. Work is delta E, work is the change in energy. That's the most important thing to, in the context of a problem, be able to apply. So work is change in energy. If you know the size of a force and a distance over an X, you can figure out how much the energy changed by, by using this equation. Um, but this should be the first thing you think about whenever you think about work. Work is the transfer of energy, change in E, Delta E, how much energy gets added, how much energy gets taken away, how much energy do I need to add to the system to heat up my copper by five degrees or whatever. That's the important thing. Okay. Um, this equation assumes a constant force. So if force is changing with time, you can't use this equation because what would you put in for F? You would not have a number. There'd be a bunch of, bunch of numbers. All right, so you have to use some um, graph tools. If you have a force versus distance or a force versus displacement graph, then the area under the curve is the work done. That's a memorized thing. All right, that's kind of what this equation says. Um, so yeah, if you see a force versus distance graph, that's the thing you do. That's the good news. Force versus distance graph, you know, or should memorize, that the thing to do is take the area under the curve of that graph and it'll tell you how much work was done. And then you go, oh, and then since work is delta E, you can figure out whatever you need to in the problem. Right, if the area of this triangle is 10, then you like gained or lost 10 joules of energy. And maybe that becomes kinetic energy, or maybe it's used to heat up uh, an object, or whatever. All right, but that's the uh, idea with that graph. Okay, last in topic three, there's some equations for types of energy. This is pretty easy. This is just counting for different amounts of energy. So EK is kinetic energy. Um, just always think about the physical causes of these energies it's not when you're doing conservation of energy don't get too lost up and be like uh oh it lost potential energy so it must gain kinetic energy um it doesn't always work like that so always think about what the what's happening with your object when you're talking about energy all right if a thing is moving it's got kinetic energy how much kinetic energy you do half times the mass times the speed of the object squared and that tells you how much kinetic energy it's got if it's moving um 
if an object changes its height in a gravitational field, it will change its potential energy. Do think about why this equation is all about a change. Um, <laughs> all right, MGH is like the sloppy version of doing this where we assume ground level is zero potential energy. But officially the equation gives us a change in potential. Um, so change in gravitational potential energy happens if you change height. If an object's not changing its height, it's not changing its gravitational potential energy. That's it. Um, of course, little g is the uh, little g in the front of the data booklet. Um, assuming we're close to Earth, that's like 9.8 or 10. All right, and this equation is for elastic potential energy. K is spring constant, so I'm talking about something springy, something that can, can be compressed or stretched to store energy. And delta x is all one thing. That's the distance that we stretch or compress our spring or whatever by to store some energy. All right, so like if there's an elastic material, stretch or compress, you use this. If there's a thing moving up and down or some height above a zero level in a gravity field, you use this. If there's a thing moving, you use this. And the deadliest equation, maybe, in the data booklet, power equals F times V. You're going to look at this equation. They're going to ask you about power. You're going to go to the data booklet and be like, ooh, there's an equation for power, F times V. It's terrible, right? Um, this is a pretty bad equation. I don't like that it's in here even. It can be useful in some contexts, but uh, here's what it is. You have to be moving at a constant speed against a resistive force to use this for this equation, really. You can sometimes get away with it in other contexts, but it's not great. So if you're going uh, at a constant speed against a resistive force, then this can tell you how much power you're like generating to go against that force or whatever. All right, so power is F times V works only in this specific case. Be really careful using this equation. The most important thing to know about power is this. This is really what power is. That should always be your first go-to with power. Don't use that stupid data booklet equation. Use this. Think about this. Change in energy over change in time. The rate of change of energy. Right? A watt is a joule per second is the most important unit you can possibly know in physics. All right, so that's how you want to think about power. And there's some efficiency stuff in this part of the data booklet. Uh, the equations pretty much define themselves to word equations. This is how they're written in the data booklet, which is kind of nice. So it's all in words. Um, so you just got to know the difference between output and input, useful output versus input versus uh, lost or degraded or wasted. Um, this part is not in the data booklet. This is kind of implied. So you just want to understand the total input would be equal to the useful output plus what is wasted. We do these with Sankey diagrams a lot, so let's look at one. Okay, so here's a Sankey diagram for energy flow. Here's a bunch of arrows. Take a moment, pause the video, try this out. What do you think? Okay, here's the idea. My input is over here, right? Here's what's coming in, and I think it's what, 10 wide? Yes, 10 wide coming in. So 10 is my input, 10, you know, whatever, arbitrary units. Um, wasted is all the arrows going down. That's the convention is anything going down is wasted and you count like the width of the blocks. So I'm wasting five here, one here, one here, and my output is one, two, three. Count the width of the blocks here, not at like the arrowhead, you know? Um, so I got three output. And it should make sense. I got five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Total output for my total input, seven of that output is waste and three is useful. Yeah, that's how we do this, Anki. This is the useful stuff. This is the stuff that's wasted. So it'll be point three. All right, try this one then with the same idea. Go ahead, pause the video, and try this. Okay, so this will be the useful output because I want my engine to do work, right? The 300 joules of work must be the useful output that we're talking about. Uh, 900 is wasted, so that's degraded. So I got to figure out the total from what they gave me. That's the only trick to this. The total must be 1,200. If like I did 300 joules of the work I wanted it to do, but wasted 900 along the way, I must have put in 1,200. So my efficiency would be a quarter. Okay, last section. Here we go is momentum and impulse. This first equation is the definition of momentum. Momentum is a math definition and it's mass times velocity. All right, so multiply an object's mass by its velocity, you will get its momentum, the quantity of motion. Um, yeah, it's a vector. So pay attention to vector stuff, direction, all that. The second equation is Newton's second law. When the IBS you to say Newton's second law, if you say F equals MA, they're going to give you nothing for it because they're stingy jerks. At Newton's second law is officially this. The rate of change of momentum is equal to the net force acting on an object. 
same deal. You got to know this is net force, not just any old force. It's the sum of all the forces. And the rate at which the momentum of an object changes is equal to its net force. All right. Um, if, if, if an object has a set mass, which is normal, um, but not in like a rocket or something, right? But assuming we have a normal thing where like the mass of an object isn't changing and it's changing momentum because it's speeding up or slowing down, then this would be delta P. So you want to be okay with why this works. If net force is delta P over delta V or delta T, right? Well, would you look at that? This becomes net force equals MA if you're not changing mass. So F equals MA comes from Newton's second law, but it is not Newton's second law. The official version of Newton's second law is this. Um, all right, there's an equation in here too, uh, which is worth mentioning. They give you kinetic energy in terms of momentum. Um, since momentum equals mv, convince yourself this is the same thing as one half mv squared. It's just convenient if you know momentum, um, which is honestly sometimes in quantum physics stuff, you know, like momentum, uh, but maybe not v. All right, so this is just another substitution version of the kinetic energy equation in terms of momentum. There you go. Impulse, this is the definition of impulse. Impulse is change in momentum. All right, it's a change in P, not just P. Um, all right, so again, it's the same Newton's second law equation, right? It's still F equals delta P over delta T, just written out differently, and their IB is helpfully telling us the definition of impulse. All right, um, so you'll have a couple different things. Um, like we just said, delta P can be M delta V if you have constant mass. Um, remember how delta P works though. This is one of the tricky things with momentum problems and like impulse or collision problems. If I come in, so here's an object bouncing off a wall, classic. The incoming momentum is MV to the left. The outgoing momentum is MV to the right. So I guess this is an elastic collision. We didn't lose any kinetic energy on the collision. So it comes out the same speed it went in at. Delta P here, don't say it's zero. That's not right, right? Because one's negative, one's positive. The difference between them, the size of the difference is 2MV. Final minus initial would be 2MV, right? So watch out for that. Um, the whole change of momentum thing when you're turning around. Make sure you account for the negatives correctly. Um, there's two ways you can write the units of momentum. They look like this. A Newton second is equal to a kilogram meter per second. Um, and one other kind of freebie, uh, if you see a force versus time graph, memorize it because you know what to do with that. It's you take the area under the curve and that's equal to the impulse. Um, that's the only thing to do with a force versus time graph uh, is take the area under the curve and set it equal to impulse. All right, this kind of means... F versus T, take the area under the curve and you'll get impulse. All right. Um, and when you take the area under the curve, it often looks like this, uh, where the height of your curve is the peak force. So sometimes you can do something fancy with that, like impulse would be this much, yeah. Uh, and this is like the duration of the collision, delta T, we sometimes call it the duration. All right, there you go. That's, uh, that's topic two, mechanics. So um, hopefully that's a little helpful. Again, there's a lot to mechanics especially, but you want to know the whole data booklet in around that level of detail. So make sure you go through, annotate the whole data booklet, know every equation, know when to use them, when not to use them, the fun little tips and tricks and graphs that might come up with them and all that stuff. It will help you out a lot for the IB exams if you can do that. All right, so hopefully this is the beginning of your data booklet annotation adventures. Um, I wish you luck and have fun.